you'll recognize this. This is a different plate from the one that Luke showed, uh, only in that it's watercolored differently. Blake, of course, didn't re believe in mass production, uh, so everyone's individually painted. Um, I'll come to it in just a moment, but let me get started. Uh, William Blake's influence upon 20th century authors, Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, and Timothy Leary has, of course, been well noted. These important voices in the history of psychedelic literature were inspired by an artistic vision that seemed to anticipate the states of consciousness so often described in psychedelic trip narratives. For Blake's work seemed to offer a way of understanding what it might be like for the, perce for the perceived boundaries that separate the self from the wider world that it inhabits to blur or evaporate altogether. But what's less well understood is that he also provided a deeply insightful analysis of the cultural, political, and historical forces that have prevented such experiences in his day and have continued to keep humankind in what Blake refers to as our fallen state. Plate 14 of The Marriage in Heaven and Hell that we have here written in 1790, shortly after the French Revolution had gotten underway, has been a particularly fertile source of inspiration in this regard. Um, I perhaps know, well, I'll read a little bit of it just so you get into Blakeian space here. Um, this is the voice of, of Blake's devil, who's a counterculture figure, who's really an angel, but of course the Church of England brands people who speak like Blake as devils, though they're the real devils. It's a little bit difficult. Anyway, the ancient tradition in the world will be consumed, that, that, that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of 6,000 years is true, as I have heard from hell. For the cherub with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at the tree of life, and when he does, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, or as it now appears, finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. Leaf, 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 squiggly stem leaf. But first the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged, this I shall do by printing in the infernal method by corrosives, which in hell are salutary and medicinal, melting apparent surfaces away and displaying the infinite which was hid. And again, hurting Luke. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. A few quick things to point out. First, the illustration at the top. We have a corpse, and we have a flying living figure, and in between, flames. And if you read enough of, the, of Heaven and Hell, you know that there are flames which are the flames of perdition, threatened, uh, uh, used as a threat for all sinners by the Church of England. These are the flames of imagination, of transformative imagination, fire always being the transformative of element of among the first of among the four. Um, the importance of body and sensual enjoyment, which Luke talked about, the self-reflexivity of the plate, that somehow um, this plate, which he's done by using an acid-resistant stylus to write backwards everything that you see here, put a dam around the outside, poured in acid to melt away apparent surfaces, roll what was left, and then hand watercolor it is his way of inviting us into his kind of, his world, um, which Ginsburg, among many others, found very trippy indeed. Um, the cleansing of the doors of perception, the doors actually got uh, their name from this plate, not derivatively from Huxley. I know that because I know the person that taught Jim Morrison at UCLA. Um, but anyway, um, what we have here is what Blake would call an apocalypse of the imagination. That is, apocalypse from the Greek meaning uh, uncover, uh, that this sort of revelation can occur at any single moment in time. It's always there and available for us if we can only but see it. So back to my paper for a moment. As one might surmise from this passage, Blake rejected the materialist worldview that had gained widespread currency in 18th century Europe, which was the result of one, Newtonian physics, which viewed nature as ultimate reducible to inert corpuscular particles of matter subject to mathematically precise laws of motion. Two, an emergent empirical methodology which sought truth only in phenomena that could be discerned by the senses. And three, John Locke's epistemological theory articulated in his, an essay concerning human understanding, 
1690, which asserted that human consciousness results solely from the material world impressing itself upon the mind through the portals of the five senses. In what follows, I'd like to explain how for Blake, this matrix of material beliefs encouraged the human spirit to close itself up till it sees all things only through the narrow chinks of its cavern, and to suggest in particular how such occluded vision fuels envy, rivalry, and violence by fragmenting consciousness into warring factions and producing an illusory dualism of self-other. First, I'd like to talk about Blake's rejection of nature, which you might find surprising. Blake's works participate in the expressivist turn in late 18th century European thought, which rebelled against neoclassical celebration of reason as the ultimate arbiter of truth by finding justification in a new authority, that of an inner voice that gave expression to the creative imagination. However, what sets Blake apart from other British Romantic period writers was his rejection of the notion that this inner authority is the voice of nature. For Wordsworth and the young Coleridge, the creative imagination is able to forge a kind of communion with the natural world whose existence otherwise stands outside and beyond itself, the self. But for Blake, the creative imagination recognizes nature in this way when viewed as something external to the self, even when it's perceived in spiritual terms is the product of an illusion rather than a source of comfort and belonging. As he remarks in his annotations to Wordsworth's poems, I see in Wordsworth the natural man rising up against the spiritual man continually. Natural objects always did and now do weaken and deaden and obliterate imagination in me. For Blake, Wordsworth's attachment to nature was merely a new manifestation of enlightenment materialism that was anathema to his non-dualistic vision of the self and he consequently directed his artistic energy toward realizing a different goal, which was to open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards into the worlds of thought, into eternity, the ever-expanding bosom of God, the human imagination. Blake's negative appraisal of nature begins with his attack on the model of the mind proposed by Locke, who, along with Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton, he often identifies as the chief architect, architect of the cell's alienation. Bacon, Newton, and Locke are his own unholy trinity. As Blake argues in his early work, um, there is no natural religion. Locke's formulation of the mind wherein all our thoughts and thus our human identity originate in sensory oppressions taken from the external world renders the self a passive receptacle of experience, incapable of imagining or desiring anything other than what experience dictates. Such a being must necessarily find itself resigned to a crippling fatalism. Blake further argues that the Lockean self must experience itself as fragmented. In its acts of self-examination, the mind splits into two, as observer and observed, thus importing the logical dichotomy between internal and external into its own structure so that the self finds itself to be like a stranger in its own home. To make matters worse, from Blake's perspective, Locke had defined personal identity only as acts of remembered consciousness, thus fragmenting the self further by ignoring the underlying roles played by its imaginative, emotional, and corporeal elements. For Blake, this mistaken understanding of the self as alienated, passively determined, and internally fragmented ideas enforced by the religious and political institutions of his time is the key source of our fallen nature. Imaginative vision by contrast, actively shapes the world it inhabits, dissolves the apparent dualisms of self and other, and finds expression through its coordinating efforts with the intellect, the passions, and the body. As his rebellious devil in the marriage of heaven and hell proclaims, man has no body distinct from his soul, for that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this, I would add, materialist age of enlightenment. Rather, energy is the only life and is from the body, and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Energy is eternal delight. Blake's devil does not mean, however, to deny the value of reason, for without it, um, for creative energy would take no particular form, that is, it would have no circumference, no shape, without reason. But if reason from its cultural position of privilege were to supplant imaginative energy, its energy, um, its bounding circumference, bounding circumference would contract 
to a vanishing point and thus bring about its own demise. For Blake, creative imagination, or what he often calls the poetic genius, instead embraces a productive tension between reason and energy, indeed between all mutually constitutive binary pairings, man, woman, lightness, darkness, positive, negative, or we might say self, other, gay, straight, cis, trans, whatever you like. His artistic vision doesn't, for example, do away with the body-soul distinction in favor of a synthesizing third term as in the Hegelian dialectic, but rather his vision conserves the individuality of each element while also stressing their interdependence. As he proclaims, um, this was a bit of a quote that, that Luke had, without contraries is no progression, so no progress without these contraries. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. But from these contraries spring what the religious call, and here he has in mind the Anglican church, good and evil. Good is passive, that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven, evil is hell. It is for Blake the followers of institutional and natural religion, such as the deists who have sought to reconcile scripture with a materialist view of nature, who stand opposed to progression and thus unwittingly to human existence itself, because they view conceptual dyads such as reason and energy in morally hierarchical terms. Here the religious wish to demote and ulti ultimately extinguish energy, whether it's political energy, artistic energy, sexual energy, transgressive energy, in favor of an intellectual and spiritual passivity that by following the dictates of reason will supposedly lead to salvation. Such logic, however, fails to recognize that to destroy either term of the dyad is to destroy the whole. Blake names this misguided attempt to privilege one term at the expense of the other a negation. So let me just use my hands for a second. Uh, a negation is when we say, uh, woman brought evil into the world through Eve, so we put, she's the demoted term, man is the top term. And what he's not doing is saying, uh, let's just reverse those and denigrate men uh, and valorize women. What he's saying is what we need is a productive tension between the two and the force field of energy wherein each keeps its individuality and yet interacts with the other is the basis for all creative thought, uh, whether it's artistically creative or sexually procreative. Um, uh, uh, so he names it a negation. This or this is a negation. And views this habit of mind as the true source of evil. To be clear, evil is not the inferior term in the good-evil binary. Evil is not this and good this. Rather, this whole system is evil. This meta-concept is, is evil. This is good for Blake. Um, so to be clear, evil is not the inferior term in a good-evil binary. Rather, evil inheres in the attempt to morally rank aspects of consciousness so that the supposedly undesirable elements are repressed and threatened with extinction. For Blake, Locke's idea of the self depended upon such negations, such as the superiority of mind over body, of reason over imagination, which fragment and constrict consciousness, leaving the self in the bewildered and forlorn state expressed by one of his characters who laments, I am like an atom, a nothing in darkness, yet I am an identity. I wish and feel and weep and groan. Ah, oh, terrible, terrible. Blake's pervasive concern is to expose the ways in which the widespread adoption of Locke's beliefs about the natural self had made the human subject profoundly unhappy in its own subjectivity, and to offer through his art an apocalyptic vision that cleanses the doors of perception to reveal the infinite that resides within each of us. In what follows, I'd like to describe how Blake dramatizes what he believed were the behavioral consequences of self-alienation, fragmentation, in the first of his three major epic poems, he also calls them prophecies, entitled The Four Zoas, or The Torments of Love and Jealousy in Death and Judgment of Albion the Ancient Man. Uh, he wrote this between 1797 and 1805 just during Napoleon's rise to power and, and through Na Napoleon's early military successes. Um, this extraordinarily complex psychodrama narrates the fall and redemption of Albion, who simultaneously symbolizes um, the psychological landscape of a single individual, 
the troubled spirit of ancient Britannia in its current political relations with Napoleonic France, and the archetypal struggle of consciousness to dissolve the subject-object distinction imposed by sense perception and reason when they are uncoupled from the promptings of the passions, the wisdom of the body, and the work of imaginative vision. Albion is a passive character who has fallen into a slumber of materialism that lasts for most of the poem's nine chapters, or what Blake calls nine nights. So Albion is asleep throughout all of the poem, which is about a hundred plates long until the very end. Um, and while he's asleep, his psychic faculties, the four zoas of reason, imagination, passion, and bodily sensation, fall into division and wage war among themselves. Albion's eventual awakening figured as the reintegration of these parts into a productive tension is brought about largely by the heroic efforts of Los, the Zoa of creative imagination, in his moments of apocalyptic epiphany. So it's really, it's, a, it's about a wholeness that in the, in the beginning that loses sight of itself during this nightmare that lasts for nine, nine long nights. The nightmare is the waking reality of Western culture over the past, since the Enlightenment, if not before. The first four of the works nights uh, describe the fallen condition of each Zoa in its misguided self-other worldview, the privilege of the self, and falls prey to the illusion that it is self-sufficient. Each declares, each Zoa declares itself to be God and master. And yet each Zoa finds itself frustrated, despairing, and haunted by feelings of emptiness or incompleteness while secretly envying the appearance of autonomy it imagines the other possesses. Their plight dramatizes the fundamental condition of humankind's fallen condition for Blake, the inability to recognize that the self's true nature is interdividual, not individual. Blake refers to this failure, as the con uh, this failure as the condition of selfhood, taken literally as a state of mind of, of, of limited vision that results from donning a hood over oneself, the hood of materialist beliefs that violate the doctrine of contraries, especially by valorizing reason and denigrating creative energy. In Blake Smith, Albion had once upon a time, or rather in the state of eternity that transcends time, experienced his fully realized self before succumbing to the spiritual slumber of alienated selfhood that has been the waking reality of modern world history. For Blake, the alienated self must always be governed by desire for the people and things from which it feels itself separated. Desire, after all, presupposes absence. For example, one desires food when one's stomach is empty. One, one then attempts to fill the emptiness by negating the food as such and assimilating it to oneself in the act of eating. The desire for affection, for love, or more fundamentally for recognition, the desire to be desired, likewise presupposes a kind of emotional emptiness that triggers, often, a similar attempt to negate and assimilate another's desire. One might even say, following a line of thinking from, from Hegel to Kozhev, that desire defines the self insofar as its ontological status is the result of its assimilating actions. You are what you eat, you are what you desire. Most importantly for Blake, the desires of the alien itself were ultimately responsible for envy, rivalry, and the violence that he witnessed in the world between individuals, families, communities, and nations, and also within the psyche of each man and woman enslaved by the mind-forged manacles and imprisoned by the cave of materialist beliefs. This cave, through which he looks out through little narrow cheeks at, at reality. In this regard, he seems to have anticipated the theories of René Girard in recognizing that desire is often based upon the illusion of autonomy. One tends to believe one's desires are self-generated, the authentic expression of self-sovereignty, when in fact they are imitative. One desires what one sees another desire. Moreover, the desiring subject fails to recognize that by imitating what another desires, his desire is actually being aimed at the being of another. His imitative behavior suggests that the subject wishes not only to be like the model, but to actually become the model, who seems to possess the enviable self-sufficiency that the subject lacks, even though the subject cannot often admit that to his or herself. However, when the envious subject attempts to imitate the other by reaching for the same object 
that the model desires or that the other desires, conflict inevitably ensues. The two become rivals, and each becomes drawn to the other by a combination of fascination and hatred. Sherard remarks, the subject is torn between two opposite feelings toward his model, the most submissive reverence and the most intense malice. This is the passion we call hatred. Only someone who prevents us from satisfying desire which he himself has inspired in us is truly an object of hatred. The person who hates first hates himself for the secret admiration concealed by his hatred. And in an effort to hide this desperate admiration from others and from himself, he no longer wants to see in his model anything but an obstacle to his desires. The rivals hide their feelings of envy from one another and from themselves uh, by projecting an image of superiority, either through contempt or affected indifference. Thus, each views the other in terms of absolute difference. Hatred only sees otherness, but it is fueled by the repression of a deeper sameness that becomes increasingly frustrating as the rivalry intensifies. An accelerating feedback loop ignited by the tension between fascination and loathing, the frustration of finding sameness where there should be difference, builds towards a climactic moment of violence that finally obliterates all distinctions. For Blake, each subject's attempt to negate the other and stand victorious ironically results in the sacrifice of the separate identity it most seeks. Now, this psychology of rivalry I've just described illuminates the key confrontations between the various Zoas that drive the plot of Blake's epic poem. I have time briefly to describe just one of them. In Night the Fifth, the fifth of nine nightmares, Envy appears as a contagion that infects, infects each character and brings them into violent conflict. We pick up the narrative with the birth of Orc, the Zoa of the passions who in its fallen state symbolizes the energy of violent revolution. To the birth of Orc to his quarrelsome parents, Los, Los is the father, the expression of creative imagination in its fallen state, and Los's mate, mother, and a Tharma. Fearful that the adolescent Orc plots his death, Father Los violently binds his son, Orc, to a rock with the chain of jealousy. When Los later attempts to free his son, he finds to his dismay that the chain has woven itself into his son's limbs so completely that Orc becomes jealousy's manifest expression. His howlings of rage travel across vast spaces to awaken the Zoa Eurizen, who is the symbol of reason in its fallen state, the limiter of energy, who despite having experienced a troubled, a troubled prophetic vision in which he sees himself forced to serve the adolescent orc, he cannot resist his fascination with orc's distressed howlings. As your reason descends into orc's caves, he beholds a world of violence, I'm quoting here, fire, rage, and blood, and discovers howling orc, whose awful limbs cast forth red smoke and fire. Your reason's response, however, is not one of fear or horror, but rather, of envy, though he affects the studied indifference of intellectual remove. Your reason approached, not near, but took his seat on a rock and ranged his books. This is the mosaic decalogue written into stone uh, around him, brooding envious over Orc. And a few lines later, your reason fixed in envy, sat brooding and covered with snow, his book of iron on his knees. Their ensuing exchange develops according to the dynamics of mimetic rivalry I've just described. Each expresses contempt for the other while concealing his own envy. Each views the other in terms of absolute difference, yet their dialogue becomes increasingly symmetrical. As each, fettered by envy, postures as autonomous and demands the other's subordination. Your reason mocks Orc's predicament. Orc affects nonchalance. Your reason lies that he's initiated their conversation purely out of pity. Orc sneers at your reason as a self-enslaved, groveling demon of woe and acts as if in joy of, of, of being in his violent prison. In, in a remarkable passage, just preceding the violent climax of their standoff, Blake brings into close relation the key concepts we've been discussing, envy, deceit, desire, and the illusion of autonomy. Quote, your reason, envious, brooding, sat and saw the secret terror orc flame high in pride and laughed to scorn the source of his own deceit. Nor knew he the source of his own, but thought himself the sole author of all his wandering experiments in the horrible abyss. 
The referential ambiguity of the pronoun his indicts both Eurizen and Orc as self-deceived. Each denies his fascination with the other and, the, and fails to recognize the mimetic origins of his behavior. Thus, if Eurizen and Orc are not in accord, as Girard would note, it is not because they're too different, but rather because they're too alike. Yet the more they grow alike, the more different they imagine themselves, and the sameness by which they are obsessed appears to them as absolute otherness. One more minute here. With each successive failure to assert a decisive difference, the tension builds to a violent crisis in which violence itself becomes the object of desire. Your reason, quote, makes Orc into a serpent form compelled to stretch out and up the mysterious tree so that he might draw all human forms into submission to his will, nor did he know the dread result that he would be drawn into limitless cycles of reciprocal violence. Rather, the signaling of your reason's victory, um, rather than signaling your reason's victory, Orc's crucifi crucifixion and metamorphosis into a serpent signifies the fusion of the two adversaries into undifferentiated violence, whose historical consequences Blake immediately explains are the policies of government ministries and state religion and sanctioning unregulated child labor, the slave trade, and military aggression seeking the supremacy of empire. Clearly for Blake, the psychodynamics of selfhood applied to the behavior of nations as well as to individuals, for in all registers of the poem, desire clings to violence and stalks it like a shadow because violence has become the signifier of divine sovereignty. As Gerald Siegel has, has observed, the Lockean consciousness that made any person a self to himself gained universality in the 18th century, not from its relation to any abstract definition of human being, but through its multiple links to everyday modes of action. It was precisely the fact that Locke's ideas had permeated all registers of British culture that caused Blake such alarm. As I've tried to suggest, Blake found in Locke's formulation of the self a fragmented and delusional selfhood um, whose way of being in the world must cause further fragmentation of personal, social, national, and in its obedience to the logic of negation rather than the productive opposition of contrarities must inevitably fall into the world of mimetic rivalry and violence that characterizes for Blake our fallen world. Thank you.